the uh, Statute of Rome states very clearly that there is no such thing as a functional in, uh, immunity so that Ursula von der Leyen or, for that matter, um, uh, Rishi Sunak uh, and uh, Emmanuel Macron and Olaf Scholz all could be indicted for complicity. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking again to Professor Dr. Dr. Alfred Desayas, our expert on human rights and international law. Professor Desayas used to work as a senior lawyer in the office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and later became the first UN independent expert on international order from 2012 to 2018. He holds a doctorate in jurisprudence from Harvard Law School and a PhD in modern history from the German University of Göttingen. Dr. Desaias is also a member of the Geneva International Peace Research Institute, where he and his team are working and recently submitted a legal case against Ursula von der Leyen, Charles Michel, and Joseph Borrell. Um, and this is exactly what we want to talk about. It's a so-called communication. And, um, well, this is it. Uh, Dr. Desaias, welcome. Thank you very much, Pascal, for inviting me again and for giving us the opportunity to uh, expose to a larger public uh, our initiative. Uh, indeed, uh, the Geneva uh, International Peace Research Institute under uh, Dr. Gabriel Galice and our Vice President uh, Gilles Emmanuel Jacquet, we're based here in Geneva. We have a long history of uh, holding very important conferences, peace conferences here uh, in Geneva, and conferences on the media, conferences uh, on uh, mediation. And uh, since uh, the uh, genocide started in uh, Gaza, uh, and of course, let's put matters uh, clear, this war did not start on the 7th of October 2023. I mean, the mainstream media gives you the impression that this is um, Israel's uh, self-defense, uh, maybe excessive self-defense uh, against uh, the Palestinians. But no, I mean, the war essentially started uh, as a colonial war, if you want, as a uh, war of uh, settlement. Uh, in 1947-48, uh, when uh, the Nakba uh, took place, the Nakba meaning the expulsion of nearly one million Palestinians from their homes, and the gradual uh, uh, destruction uh, of the Palestinian people by ethnic cleansing. Uh, it's a complex of war crimes and crimes against humanity, but in slow motion. And obviously everybody remembers uh, Shabra and Shatila and uh, so many uh, attacks on uh, Palestinian refugee centers and uh, uh, so many war crimes that have occurred in total impunity on the part of, uh, of Israel. But now we were faced with something uh, much more acute. Uh, you had an all-out assault on the civilian population uh, of Gaza. And uh, notwithstanding what the impressions uh, in the New York Times and in the Washington Post and uh, in Le Monde and in the BBC and in the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, let's face it, uh, the victims are and have always been the Palestinians. The perpetrators have been the Israelis. It's the Israelis who are imposing uh, a settler colonialism in a territory that was uh, occupied peacefully by uh, Palestinians for thousands of years. So here you have a situation comparable uh, to the white Europeans coming to South Africa and pushing off uh, the native uh, uh, 
African population and putting them into Bantu stands and putting them, uh, just using them as cheap labor. And that is what Israel has done uh, in its colonizing practice. But uh, one thing is uh, reducing the Palestinians to second class citizens and treating them uh, under a regime of apartheid, which, by the way, uh, my uh, president, uh, Jimmy Carter, already in the year 2006, described as being apartheid. Uh, Jimmy Carter, who is a true uh, peace uh, president, someone who uh, genuinely wanted to have world peace, he has made uh, over the last decades uh, many proposals how to achieve a two-state uh, solution. And of course, the alternative is a one-state solution. You probably know the book by Professor Virginia Tilly on the one-state solution. But getting back uh, to the violence uh, of Israel, of the Israeli defense uh, force against uh, the Palestinian civilians uh, in Gaza. Uh, this is not just uh, an act of barbarity, of barbarism. Uh, this uh, reaches the threshold of genocide. Everybody remembers back in 1994 how the genocide in Rwanda played out. And at the time, people said, well, how could we stand by and watch this? Well, that's what the world did. Uh, the world let it happen. France let it happen. The United States uh, let it happen. And then after that, there was a commitment never again. We're never going to allow genocide to occur before our eyes. Well, we're seeing it today. We're seeing it on our screens. We're seeing it on television. We're hearing uh, the uh, voices of the survivors. And uh, we have the reports of uh, uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross, of the Red Crescent Society, of uh, uh United Nations uh, rapporteurs who have... Francesca uh, Albanese. Yes. Uh, I mean, we have all of the evidence we need. Uh, we see that uh, there is intent to destroy in whole or in part the uh, Palestinian uh, population. The end game is simply to push them all out so that you have uh, uh, Israel controlling the entire territory uh, and uh, not allowing a two-state uh, um, uh, solution as we know that Netanyahu is totally against a two-state uh, solution. And he doesn't care that the International Court of Justice has issued three orders essentially saying uh, there is evidence uh, that this is uh, genocide. The court has not yet said this is genocide. That will come in the final judgment on the merits. But the court has said because of this, we issue provisional measures of protection. And there have been three of them, the first one being the 26th of January of this year. They have been completely ignored by Israel with the support and complicity of the United States, United Kingdom, France, uh, the European Union itself, etc. And that is what gave us the idea earlier this year. Let's uh, let the court decide on the issue of genocide. Let uh, the uh, International Criminal Court decide on the um, appeals that have been made to it to issue arrest warrants against uh, uh, Netanyahu and his Minister of Defense. Uh, what interested us as civil society in the Geneva uh, uh, International Peace Research Institute 
what was crucial for us is to focus on the issue of complicity. A genocide doesn't occur in a vacuum. There are all sorts of interrelationships. And uh, it is clear that uh, European governments, in particular uh, the uh, European Union uh, states, have given military, political, economic, financial, propagandistic uh, support to Israel. They have backed up Israel uh, diplomatically. If you look at uh, the statements uh, by Ursula von der Leyen, uh, by uh, uh, Charles Michel, by uh, uh, Joseph Borrell uh, in October, November, January uh, of this year, you see that there has been a complete support of Israel and a reversal of the roles. So Israel is presented as the victim of terrorism and the Palestinians are being depicted as terrorists. That, by the way, this kind of... Uh, incitement to hatred against a people. And that's what we're having here. Incitement to hatred against Palestinians in general. Everybody is amalgamated. Everybody uh, is seen as um, uh, terrorists and violent yeah. people who, who don't deserve a state. And we have more than enough uh, examples of people officially saying there are no civilian, there are no innocent people in Gaza, we on all levels, from the soldiers up to, I think, Aland or others said so too. I mean, we've, well, we've got I enough. Mean, there, there, there are many statements uh, that uh, will uh, remind us all of uh, the Second World War and of Nazi Germany, the way the SS uh, treated uh, not only the Jews, because they treated uh, Russians and uh, Ukrainians and Poles as untermenschen. This is a, shall we say, a very racist approach uh, that uh, we have in the West. Uh, we auto define ourselves as the good guys, as the civilized people, and then everybody else uh, is less yeah. than us. And that is what we see in the kind of apartheid that the um, Palestinians have endured for 75 years. But uh, going back to the criminal responsibility, uh, the uh, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, established a jurisprudence on issues of incitement uh, to racial hatred and also issues of complicity. And quite concretely now, with regard uh, to the uh, European uh, Union and Ursula von der Leyen, uh, you would have expected that uh, the European Union would have insisted, not now, but already in the year 2004, when the International Court of Justice issued its uh, advisory opinion on the wall, which very uh, systematically documented the violations of the 1949 Geneva Conventions, of the um, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, etc., etc. You would have expected the European Union to take action, not to continue business as usual with Israel when Israel has been condemned by the International Court of Justice for violating all of these treaties. Now, uh, it's this, this double standards that is so uh, offensive 
to the concept of the rule of law and to the concept of civilization itself, uh, when uh, the uh, European Union points fingers at Africans and at the Asians and uh, for violations of human rights. But when it comes to Israel, they don't mind. And they uh, continue supporting Israel diplomatically and uh, uh, economically, etc. Militarily. And, and doing business with them. Now, the General Assembly over the last 75 years has adopted any number of resolutions concerning the right of self-determination of the Palestinian people. Even the Security Council has resolutions on the self-determination of uh, the Palestinian people. You would expect that the representative of the European Union would support, endorse, promote the implementation of General Assembly and Security Council resolutions. That has not been the case. So all of that has impacted us and not only us in the Geneva International Peace Research Institute, but our colleagues in France, as I said, we uh, were significantly uh, aided by this uh, consortium of uh, uh, French lawyers who, as Europeans, feel uh, let down by the European Union. They are uh, shocked that the European Union acts in this manner that is not conform, shall we say, with uh, the uh, Treaty of Lisbon, that is not conform uh, with Article 2, uh, which is the article on, uh, on human rights and fundamental freedoms. So uh, that being the case, uh, we put out uh, a letter. We didn't want to, uh, shall we say, leapfrog and uh, immediately go to Karim Khan, the uh, prosecutor uh, of the International Criminal Court, uh, we drafted a long letter uh, that was sent to Ursula von der Leyen and to uh, Charles Michel and uh, Joseph Borrell, and we got no reaction, whatever. Then there was a follow-up letter Again, no reaction. And then we issued a manifesto saying what were our concerns were. Our concerns for peace, the necessity of immediate uh, ceasefire, the necessity of mediation, the necessity of uh, reconciliation and reconstruction. I mean, these the Palestinians are not about to disappear. They are there. And uh, Israel may want to push them all out, uh, but uh, that is prohibited specifically in Article 49 of the Geneva Conventions of 1949. Ethnic cleansing is a crime, has been declared to be uh, not only a crime against humanity, but genocide, uh, General Assembly resolutions saying that uh, ethnic cleansing is a form of genocide. So, uh, we felt we should bring this to the attention. We should put Ursula von der Leyen on notice that uh, she is complicit uh, in genocide. And as I said, in the absence of reaction from the European Union, because essentially uh, when you say something like this, uh, since they cannot refute what you're saying, they simply ignore you. You do not exist. Your documents don't exist. I publish re uh, frequently in Counterpunch in the United States. I put into Counterpunch the open letter, the follow-up to the open letter, the manifesto, again, made it very public that we were going to present a uh, complaint, a communication uh, to the uh, uh, prosecutor. So on the 25th of uh, of May this year, we finally did so. And can you, um, 
can you can you explain that a bit more like what does a communication to the international criminal court mean so you wrote this very long document i mean i'm going to show it here uh, and I, i know you have it over there too it's, it's a long and very well crafted legal document in which you outline um, all of the complaints and introduction jurisdiction the background general standards of complicity you really make a case that the eu is complicit and then you sent that to Mr. Khan, right? Um, and it, it, this is a way to uh, to request from civil society a criminal investigation by the ICC. Is that is that so? Exactly. Now, Article 15 of the Statute of Rome uh, gives the prosecutor uh, the discretion uh, to... Uh, start investigations or to request um, arrest warrants uh, on the basis of information that he receives. Now, this information can be forwarded by states, by intergovernmental organizations, but of course can be also uh, forwarded by civil society, by uh, a non-governmental organization. By the way, we have consultative status uh, with uh, the United Nations. And uh, we participate uh, in the Human Rights Council and any number of other uh, United Nations uh, institutions. So uh, it is in his hands uh, to do something with it or to put it aside and ignore it. That is why we have gone public That is why we issued a uh, press release that has been picked up uh, in the United States, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia. So it has had a good impact, uh, the uh, the press release. Uh, but um, the wheels of justice turn very slowly. Uh, I don't see Karim Khan um, uh, issuing uh, a... Uh, Uh, a warrant for the arrest of Ursula von der Leyen uh, anytime soon. But what uh, I would hope is that an investigation be opened, and that would give the International Criminal Court uh, the possibility of expanding on the concept uh, of complicity. What exactly is complicity? In our legal uh, brief, we explicitly give, uh, shall we say, uh, the content uh, of this complicity in military support, economic support, financial support, diplomatic support, political support, etc. Now, he has it all in his hands. Now, he has a big staff of lawyers who can actually uh, prepare a recommendation to the judges so that the judges issue uh, an arrest warrant. But we need people like you uh, in the press uh, to give visibility uh, to this uh, initiative. The initiative is, from the international law aspect, is solid. It is uh, within the Statute of Rome, and it is consistent with the object and purpose of the International Criminal Court. It is uh, consistent with the object and purpose of the International Court of Justice, because we let, let's see this whole picture. Uh, we've had uh, the South African uh, case brought against Israel already in December of 2023, and the first order of the International Court of Justice of the 26th of January of this year. Uh, in the meantime, uh, a number of states uh, have joined uh, South Africa, including uh, Nicaragua and Colombia and Mexico, etc., cetera, uh, who are uh, pushing for a decision on the merits by the International Court of Justice that this is genocide. But that doesn't, talk about the issue of complicity yeah. in genocide that's not that that would uh be a uh shall we say a doctrinal finding 
uh, that will be very useful to the International Criminal Court, yeah. which is the institution that has the competence to issue warrants of arrest. And as you know, there's no uh, functional immunity uh, on the part of uh, Ursula von der Leyen that is ex explicit. Article 27 of uh, the uh, Statute of Rome states very clearly that there is no such thing as a functional in, uh, immunity so that Ursula von der Leyen or for that matter, um, uh, Rishi Sunak uh, and uh, Emmanuel Macron and Olaf Scholz all could be indicted for complicity. Yeah, so I think this is really important. Like on the ICJ side, we have states that are suing other states, um, South Africa suing uh, uh, Israel and trying to establish that uh, genocide is, is is going on, although this is going to take a long time, but the provisional measures indicate that the It really that the should court not take a long is, time. The evidence is so overwhelming. The, the, the evidence and is overwhelming, but the process such. can be can be drawn out. But on the ICC case, uh, ICC side, we have there is actually a tool in international law that can take out uh, or that can that can really cause huge trouble on decision makers. Right? So, uh, Vladimir Putin already decided not to travel to South Africa last year, most probably because exactly. of this ICC exactly. work. So, but the, the point is also. I think the important thing that, I'm, that I've learned through what you're doing is that you don't have to be a government of a, of a country in order to try to use the ICC. You can be a non-governmental organization and, and do that because like, governments, I'm pretty sure South Africa would not uh, issue kind of an, uh, uh, a communication to the ICC to, to get Ursula von der Leyen because uh, South Africa as a state still needs to trade, et, et cetera. But, but if we have a lot of... Um, civil society organizations who request that, not just you, but others, templates and download and, and fill in their case and, and submit and submit. There could be a civil society push in the IC, uh, toward the ICC to, to start reacting. And as you could correctly say, the media environment. So this is the approach that you're taking, right? Um, by the way, I can send that to you. Uh, we just issued it. Uh, since we submitted the case to the... Um, prosecutor on the 25th of March of uh, May. May. Uh, we have had uh, endorsement of many other uh, non-governmental organizations, civil society institutions, professors, uh, experts, and uh, that is going to uh, give additional weight uh, to this complaint. We are forwarding this updated uh, list uh, of organizations that are endorsing uh, the legal brief. Among them, uh, I'm also a member of them, uh, the Asociación Española para el Derecho Internacional de los Derechos Humanos. That is the leading Spanish uh, organization on uh, the international uh, human rights uh, system protection system. Uh, and the president of the uh, association is a former colleague of mine at the United Nations at the Office of the High Commissioner, uh, Professor uh, um, uh, Carlos Villan Duran. So he has signed in his personal capacity as a uh, professor and the association has signed in its quality as an NGO. Uh, and uh, there have been many others that are on this list. So it is gaining momentum. And we need more visibility. We've sent it to the Monde Diplomatique. Unfortunately, we're not getting any reaction from the Monde Diplomatique. Uh, we're not getting any reaction here at the Tribune de Genève or not reaction uh, from um, the major uh, newspapers, uh, because they all seem to be intimidated. They all seem to be afraid. Um, and uh, it's it's a problem. It's a problem of uh, perception also, because uh, uh, we have been so indoctrinated 
uh, so brainwashed uh, into uh, believing that Israel is the only uh, democratic country in the Middle East and we should support Israel, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that when you say, wait a minute, is that true? Uh, and is uh, Israel behaving uh, as a state under the rule of law? Is it behaving as a state that respects uh, the uh, human rights of all persons living under its jurisdiction? And when you realize that that is not the case, any number of other questions arise. Because you find that uh, the mainstream media, far from informing society, far from uh, being the watchdog uh, of our rights, mainstream media is basically a an echo chamber for Washington, for the Pentagon, uh, for uh, Israel, for the... Uh, and uh, it's uh, it's painful to accept uh, that your illusions about uh, international law and about uh, the international institutions created uh, to protect our rights, uh, that that does not conform with reality. Yeah, That doesn't mean that you're going to bail out and you're going to abandon it. You have to continue, persevere, yeah. and insist on your rights. You have to reclaim your rights. Yeah, but this is this is this is something we are seeing right now. I mean, this whole thing started absolutely horribly, gruesomely, and then over time we have now seen international legal pressure building up. ICJ, ICC, and now Mr. Khan actually request requested warrants at the ICC against uh, Netanyahu and Gallant, right? Uh, besides three Hamas leaders, which is kind of ironic because I think if the ICC managed to get these three, they would be protected much better than in custody than where they are now, but. <laughs> Let's leave that one aside. Um, the, but you can see how how Israel is really, really, really angry at this, and this. So there is there is a, there is something, and and the student protests that are all moving in this direction. So there is power to this to this process. And my question is, um, if not just you, but if if like others, other civil society organization also wrote communications to the ICC saying arrest. Uh, von der Leyen, arrest von der Leyen. These people are aiding and abetting genocide. Arrest them. If 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 that happened, um, do you think the ICC is independent enough? Does this does this institution uh, internally, the way it works, have the capacity to actually start moving that that route, even just with an investigation? Yes, I am optimistic that they can and that they must. Now, uh, it will be under pressure. You probably heard read in the press uh, that our firebrand senator from South Carolina, uh, Lindsey Graham, uh, uh, met with um, State uh, Secretary of State um, uh, Anthony Blinken and discussed uh, the possibility of imposing bipartisan sanctions on the uh, International Criminal Court. Uh, you may remember uh, that uh, back uh, in uh, the Trump years uh, that Trump imposed uh, on the International uh, Criminal Court, on the then prosecutor and her staff, Fatou Ben Souda, imposed uh, sanctions. And uh, that was condemned solidly by uh, Human Rights Watch, by Amnesty International, I was uh, very impressed that they had the courage uh, to say, uh, what are you doing? You cannot blackmail uh, international criminal justice. You cannot put the judges uh, on a uh, sanctions list. It's just too absurd. It is upending uh, the whole concept uh, of the rule of law and of the independence of the uh, of uh, lawyers and, ju and judges, etc. So, uh, uh, there are American senators and American congressmen uh, who would uh, want to uh, 
impose sanctions on the court. The United States, uh, of course, is not uh, a uh, member uh, of the Statute of Rome. Uh, it actually, it, it signed it back in 1998 at the time it. of President uh, Clinton. But then in 2002, uh, it uh, what <laughs> Condoleezza Rice said at the time uh, that the United States unsigned it. That is not true. I mean, you cannot unsign a document. What you can do is you send a notification uh, to the depository of the Statute of Rome saying uh, that you have no intention of ever ratifying it. And that way, uh, I mean, basically, uh, you are... Uh, are free to undermine it. And that is what the United States has done systematically uh, since 2002 with something like 80 uh, bilateral uh, impunity agreements that the United States has signed with the uh, states parties to the Statute of Rome saying that uh, if there's ever a warrant against an American citizen, you know, they are not allowed by virtue of this bilateral agreement, they're not allowed uh, to deliver uh, an American to the International Criminal Court. Of course, it's against the object and purpose of the ICC and these 80 countries, which must have been placed under a lot of pressure, uh, should never have uh, entered into those agreements, which are also ab initio null and void because they are against uh, uh, good morals. They're contra bonus mores, Article 53 of the uh, Vienna Convention of the Law Treaties. Le, 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 um, very well taken, but let's go back again to this to this communication of yours. Um, are you? Did you receive a, 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 a notification from the court that it was received? Uh, do yes, you know that? That was, of course we have it. That we had um, the day after. So we were fine. Uh, the question is, will the court, which as I say, works slowly, uh, actually act. It is mm -hmm. within the discretion of Karim Khan to act or to ignore it. Yep. So it's not like a referral. If you have a referral uh, from the Security Council or from a state, uh, then the prosecutor uh, has to take it. But uh, it is not foreseen that a non-governmental organization can order uh, the prosecutor to, to take up something. But uh, if he is true to his mandate, true to Article 15 of the Statute of Rome, then he has to do it. It's not a question of war crimes under Article 8, or he, it's a question of genocide, the ultimate crime. That's uh, Article 6. Uh, of the uh, Statute of Rome. If, there, if there's anything urgent uh, in the Statute of Rome is the prevention uh, of uh, genocide. The same thing, if you take the, Geneva, the Genocide Convention of 1948, uh, Article 1 puts the emphasis on prevention. Basically, punishment is only ex post facto. It's mm. after the genocide has taken place. Uh, you have to prevent the genocide, and that is where the Euro uh, European Union has failed totally. The European Union has done nothing uh, to prevent the genocide. And uh, Nicaragua, you may remember, presented a case uh, against Germany uh, in, the before ICJ. The international, in the ICJ, before the International Court of Justice. And the International Court of Justice took the case. It is a registered case. It's being examined. But unfortunately, the judges at the ICJ uh, copped out. The judges should have issued an order uh, ordering Germany to stop any military deliveries uh, to, uh, uh, to Israel. And the court uh, decided that it was not so urgent. I mean, it's ridiculous. There's nothing more urgent than stopping genocide. And one of the ways of stopping genocide is uh, making it, uh, I mean, imposing a total embargo, uh, arms embargo on, on Israel. That is one way of doing it. 
uh, and the court uh, did not have the courage to do so. In the in the in the defense of the court, though, if I remember correctly, the argumentation Germany argued that they are not uh, aiding genocide, that they are that they're not doing any of the things that they are accused of, and the court then said. Uh, fine, if you're not doing this, continue not doing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we put an eye on you, Germany. If you, if you, if you actually turn out to be doing it sure. well, there will be problems. Yeah, in the there, future, there was but an the intelligent article uh, that I uh, I read in uh, the German press about it, uh, yeah. saying uh, don't underestimate uh, the uh, uh, order of the uh, yeah. International the Court of Justice case, yeah. because the International Court of Justice reaffirmed everything that it had already said mm -hmm. in the case South Africa against uh, Germany. And of course, it is, shall we say, inherent in those three orders of the International uh, Court of Justice against Israel that any other state cannot cooperate with Israel yes. in making uh, this genocide possible. Yeah, and uh, if so, you if you do, you make yourself liable, and you you as a head of state uh, or head of government, you are not you are not immune by virtue of what you are. The ICC can come and get you. I mean, this is the threat we need, right? We need to threaten these leaders that they they cannot act with impunity, and the ICC is the one institution that has the power to do that. Yes, no, I as I said, I have been a believer uh, in. Uh, the power of courts and tribunals. And I think that the um, summit of the future that the United Nations uh, is organizing would do well uh, to focus on the rule of law and to focus on strengthening uh, local, regional, and international courts and tribunals. I'm also a member of um, uh, a, an NGO in San Francisco uh, called uh, uh, the Legal Pact, www.legalpact.org. And uh, that is what we want. We want a strengthening uh, of the institutions. And uh, I do believe that the International Court of Justice can do a lot of good. I do believe that International Criminal Court can do a lot of good. On the other hand, I'm not blind and I'm not naive. I am aware that uh, judges are put under pressure. I'm aware that um, uh, when the uh, perpetrators are countries like the United States uh, or uh, Israel, it is uh, more difficult. Uh, to put them on the dock than if you're trying to put um, uh, al-Bashir of, uh, uh, of Sudan uh, on the dock or if you're trying to put an African, etc. And that is one of the reasons why uh, there is um, a malaise uh, in the African Union about their membership. Uh, in the Statute of Rome, uh, back a few years ago, there was actually a movement uh, to leave the International uh, mm. Criminal Court en masse. And uh, I can see that very easily happening uh, if the court fails to indict uh, Netanyahu uh, and Diane. Or even worse, imagine this scenario. The court does not indict Netanyahu, but does indict the Hamas people. <laughs> it, it's over. In that, that case, be, it's over. Like, uh, it would be such a slap in the face of uh, the world, uh, of the global majority, that I could see uh, really uh, uh, a departure. Because uh, that would be the last nail in the coffin. Uh, of the ICC. I mean, they had a troubled beginning. I think it was wrong for three uh, prosecutors uh, not to open uh, an investigation, not to uh, issue indictments against those uh, Western leaders who were involved in uh, the assault uh, on the people of Iraq 
uh, in uh, 2003. Uh, certainly, Tony Blair should have come before the court. Certainly, um, uh, Jose Maria Aznar uh, of Spain uh, and many uh, of the leaders who participated uh, gave uh, aid and comfort to the United States in its uh, aggression uh, against Iraq. All of these leaders should have been indicted. I mean, if the court wants to, uh, shall we say, establish its authority and its credibility, uh, it cannot afford using double standards. It cannot afford excluding uh, Western leaders and then focusing only on Africans or on Putin, for instance. Yeah. I mean, that uh, is, um, shall we say, uh, it's a disgrace uh, when uh, that happens, but I'm not giving up. I, I, I see signs uh, that uh, uh, the court uh, is coming of age, and I would hope uh, that the court will help us stop uh, this genocide, stop this war, and uh, help the poor Palestinians who have been massacred and subjected to apartheid for uh, 75 years. But concretely, um, putting aside uh, the legal brief, putting aside uh, the strictly, shall we say, legal uh, considerations, uh, in practice, uh, what are we doing in the West? Business as usual. If you want Israel to stop uh, its genocide and to behave, uh, we must demand from Israel as an ultimatum, stop the genocide, stop the war, or we're going to stop all commercial relations with you. You know, Israel might even survive if we stop diplomatic relations with it. But if we stop commercial relations uh, with Israel... Uh, well, certain in... commercial uh, relations, uh, especially banks, if they stop uh taking uh, taking money and 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 just just transactions uh, that 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 would have an impact but that that uh, hasn't absolutely. happened that... and for that you do not need uh, a resolution of the security council uh and uh, i could see the general assembly adopting a uniting for peace type resolution since the Security Council uh, has not mm -hmm. imposed any sanctions on Israel, the Security Council, because of some 80 vetoes by the United States, has not uh, allowed uh, the um, United Nations system under ch uh, uh, Chapter 7 to be effective uh, in the war in Gaza. Uh, the General Assembly can, and there's precedence, can take responsibility and say, adopt a resolution urging states to stop commercial, banking, yeah. financial uh, cooperation uh, with, uh, uh, with Israel. Uh, of course, the General Assembly will not be able to enforce it but imagine uh, that a uh, hundred states in the world uh, decide that it, they will stop financial relationships uh, with Israel. Uh, that would make Israel's economy grind to a halt. Question. If we have or when we get such a UN resolution, would this enable civil societies in Switzerland, in, in the UK, and so on, to, to sue our own governments to, to create legislation or uh, that forbids banks from, uh, from, transacting, from transactions with Israeli entities? Because we need that. We need a tool in order to, to pressure legally 
our institutions to 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 stop transact to stop working with Israel. It, it it would be a tremendous help. Doesn't mean that uh, it is a conditio sine qua non. Uh, I think civil society can already demand that uh, of um, governments. I have in a number of articles uh, are published in Switzerland. I have uh, demanded uh, that the uh, federal government prohibit uh, banks from bending to illegal United States uh, unilateral coercive measures. For instance, uh, if you make a donation, uh, and it happened huh, in the time of COVID, make a donation uh, for ventilators uh, for victims of COVID in Venezuela or in Cuba, et cetera, the UBS will not transfer the money. As a matter of fact, the UBS has no transactions with Cuba or with uh, Venezuela or with countries under uh, uh, U.S. sanctions, which means that the United States is imposing extraterritorially its legislation in Switzerland, thereby violating the sovereignty of uh, Switzerland. It is the obligation of Switzerland to protect its banks, to protect its enterprises from illegal unilateral coercive measures by the United States, and to sue the United States on behalf of its citizens. And that has not happened. And uh, I think that the uh, uh, Swiss government is being complicit in the crimes of the United States through its unilateral coercive measures uh, because it has not taken legal action against the United States for violation of its sovereignty or legal action in order to protect uh, its enterprises. So yeah. here again, we have a failure uh, of the system of enforcement of international law yeah. and international treaties, and it's being tolerated and it's being whitewashed the, the uh, by the mainstream media. The problem, the problem we have is that even if Switzerland tried to take measures, actually for the U.S. it's pretty simple to get out of it because it's and its way of coercing the UBS is not by threatening Switzerland; it's by threatening UBS uh, business in the U.S. and that you know sovereign right. The U.S. has the right to say like UBS, we don't like you. We you, you cannot do business here. Bye, be gone. Which would be the death for UBS, right? And so, uh, unfortunately, this is a structural uh, it's way. It's not that simple. It's not that simple. It does entail uh, effects uh, in Switzerland. And it also entails effects uh, on uh, the uh, people subject to sanctions like uh, uh, the Cubans and the Nicaraguans and the Syrians and etc., uh, you have to consider that uh, sanctions kill. Yes. And this kind of sanctions in particular kill because if uh, you cannot get uh, insulin and you are diabetic, you die and that's the end of it. So you have to take that uh, into account. And I think that uh, Switzerland has not even made, um, you know, I'm a strong official protest against this abuse uh, of the United States in, in extraterritorially um, expand, expanding uh, its jurisdiction. Uh, going back to Gaza, because that is our focus, uh, if Ursula von der Leyen uh, had, uh, had a different narrative, uh, if from the beginning uh, she would have said, uh, uh, we Europeans cannot be complicit in a war against self-determination. That is the crux of the matter. People try mm. to forget uh, self-determination. Uh, the Palestinian people have a right to self-determination, which has been confirmed by 
hundreds, if not thousands, of resolutions of the General Assembly, ECOSOC, uh, the Human Rights Council, the Human Rights Committee, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Switzerland uh, is a state party to all of these treaties. The European countries represented in the European Union are also states parties to all of these uh, uh, commitments. And uh, they're not applying Mm. human rights law and um, uh, there has been no clear condemnation uh, of Israel uh, for genocide out of the mouths uh, of uh, Ursula von der Leyen or uh, uh, Charles Michel so here you have the concept of uh, complicity by omission yeah you have a responsibility. You have a uh, position in an institution uh, that requires uh, that uh, you implement uh, the human rights treaties uh, that all of the states of the European Union are party to. And um, Ursula von der Leyen has famously failed uh, in her uh, function. And she has given, uh, shall we say, uh, aid and comfort uh, to Israel. Uh, she has made statements that uh, are really uh, offensive, obnoxious, uh, petulant. And uh, I think that um, the perception of Ursula von der Leyen uh, has been supported by an enormous public relations campaign. I mean, the propaganda in favor of Ursula von der Leyen and the European Commission and the European Union uh, is such that uh, the masses uh, in European countries uh, simply do, do not even think that uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, could be uh, guilty of complicity in genocide. It's just uh, the Germans have a wonderful expression for that. Denk verbot. Mm. I don't know any other language that has that. It is uh, a prohibition to think, to think something. That is, you've been so indoctrinated that when an idea pops into your head that is particularly unorthodox your brain blocks it you say uh we're not going there i'm not going to move further you know that's a minefield that's and, dangerous and, and so i think this you, is your brain this stops is what, you this is what you're trying to change we are trying here through international law through through the avenues available and through media publicity to try to change this perception and what can be done and we are unfortunately re uh, nearing one hour of, of talk, so I, I uh, we do have to part. But uh, Alfred, I want to wish you the best of luck. And other people, if you want to, uh, somewhere in the world, you want to do a similar thing, get in touch with me. I'll put you in touch with Alfred. And, and, then, and then keep pushing. Push the ICC to indict, to, to, to do something with these people. I find that a great idea. Yes. Now, hold here. Mm. Human rights industry. Alfred, 2023. I have a whole chapter on the International Criminal Court. I was a great supporter of the International Criminal Support at the beginning, and I participated with the great Professor Sharif Basuni uh, in uh, drafting draft statutes uh, for the ICC when I used to be professor in Chicago. And I must say, uh, my chapter also explains my evolution uh, from uh, great believer uh, to disappointed believer and now uh, hopeful believer that there can be now under uh, Karim Khan uh, with this recommendation of uh, uh, indicting uh, uh, Netanyahu that there can be a shall we say, a rebirth 
uh, of the ICC. And let us hope that uh, through you and other members in the media, uh, the concept of the complicity of uh, institutions like the uh, European Union, and in particular, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, that uh, people will understand uh, that it is these people who are aiding and abetting uh, the genocide who bear co-responsibility for the genocide. And these people uh, must be perceived uh, in the minds of uh, all democratic peoples uh, in Europe they must be uh, perceived as accomplices uh, in a crime and they should never be re-elected to office again. Wonderful final words. Alfred Desaius, speak to you again next time. Thank you. Thank you.